Hey everybody, welcome to this week's edition of Shop Talk. I'm your host, Riley Bowman, and uh, Jacob's just hanging out around here too, apparently, in the warehouse today, doing literally nothing. So, uh, hey, uh, real quick, where's those uh, travelers, traveler's guides at? Where's the traveler's guides? I know they're somewhere around here. Let's see, traveler's guides. Sweet. Hey, have you picked up one of these? Got to get turned the right way. These are pretty cool. Uh, but we just launched a new ebook that is kind of like the Traveler's Guide, but different. In some ways, better. And today's shop talk is about what to do when you're traveling out of state, what to know before you go. Uh, that's a really important thing to know, and it's actually a common question that we get all the time here at ConcealedCarry.com. And uh, so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Hey, Noah and Mark, uh, Shana, hey, thanks for joining, and Anita and Tris, Richard, Doyle, hey guys, thanks for popping in today. Uh, so, uh, be a little bit different chop talk than last week's, and uh, a little, little bit more laid back. I'm just going to be chilling here on the, on the uh, couch here today talking about traveling out of state and understanding state laws. Dean, hello, Dean, David, Sonia, I think it's Sonia, right? Good day from Cali. Where in Cali are you, Sonia? Chad is uh, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, which I'm kind of jealous of. I mean, I'm out here in the Rockies, which is also something to be jealous of, but uh, Blue Ridge Mountains are pretty cool too. <clears throat> hey, Delena, glad you made it. Russ, thanks for checking in. Cammy, hi, Cammy. Uh, and Sean, uh, Chad from Ohio, even this guy, this strange guy Jacob is watching apparently. <clears throat> uh, let's see, uh, Keone, hello man, I don't remember seeing you in a while, uh, aloha. Uh, David, what's up man? So again, today we're talking about uh, traveling out of state or traveling between states, what to know before you go. Uh, and uh, this is something we sell on our website, the Traveler's Guide to the Firearm Laws of the 50 States. This is the 2019 edition. We just got these in a few weeks ago. So totally up to date for 2019. Gives you a nice, simple legal summary, state by state by state. And then also at concealedcarry.com, we have launched our own ebook that is similar in nature. Breaks down laws state by state by state. And uh, But it does so in a little bit different format, in a little bit different way. It also has a lot of other additional information in there, such, about, such as the uh, Firearm Protector, Firearm, fire, firearm, firearm Owners Protection Act. Uh, there's some information in there about that. There's information about hotels. There's information about uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, storing firearms in vehicles, uh, what to do when you're traveling by air, uh, what to do with your guns when you're traveling through states that uh, don't respect uh, your gun laws, or your gun rights, I mean. And uh, hey, Marquise, what's up? And Vernon, and Kenny, Daniel, Gary, Larry, Brian, Scott, unfortunately from Illinois. You know, I'm learning more and more about Illinois all the time, and Illinois itself actually isn't all that bad. Uh, Chicago and Cook County is one thing, but the rest of the state's actually pretty cool. Yeah, you do have that whole firearm owner ID card thing you gotta have, which is kind of lame, but... Uh, uh yeah so david hello you got a copy of of this that's awesome so what i want you guys to do today is uh go to concealedcarry.com forward slash uh law ebook l-a-w-e-b-o-o-k you're gonna be able to pick up a copy of the ebook for super super cheap like two bucks and 23 cents 223 remington right uh so let's talk about it all right, so let's talk about what to know before you go. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you kind of like the big five things probably. Uh, I don't have a specific number, but we're gonna talk about some key things that I look for before I travel into other states. Uh, one last little shout out, Jared. Thank you for checking in, Bobby, Lynn, and Tris. Thanks, guys. Uh, whole whopping 82 of you, 84 of you right now. It's awesome. Good good showing today, guys. Um, also, before I get too far along, let me preview this week. As far as the podcast and giveaways are concerned, uh, this week, tomorrow, will be our industry news day uh, for the podcast. 
And uh, so we'll look forward to all kinds of interesting news stories from across the industry uh, in tomorrow's podcast. Uh, that, of course, will air at 12 noon uh, Mountain Time, Mountain Daylight Time now. I'm actually really relieved to be back on Daylight Time. It's my favorite time of the year. Have a little bit more uh, evening light. Uh, couldn't care less about the light in the morning. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, so tomorrow will be industry news. And we're going to be announcing the winner of a of the complete home defense DVD set. Uh, that'll be the giveaway winner tomorrow. <clears throat> so if you haven't registered for that, you have till tonight, midnight Mountain Time, to go to concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize. Make sure you're signed up for tomorrow's giveaway for the complete home defense DVD set. It's a really good DVD set, valued at mm, sixty something, fifty something. It's, it's it's worth it's worth a bit. It's a good good little package that deal there. Uh, let's see. And then Thursday we are going to be talking about the title of that episode is going to be the ultimate uh, guide to gun safes, and we're going to talk about what what to look for in a quality gun safe, uh, gun vaults, handgun vaults, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, it's kind of a big big deal to us here at ConcealedCarry.com. We sell quite a bit of those uh, little handgun vaults, especially from Sports Afield, and also some from Gun Vault. And uh, yeah, so you should have one of those. I, I like using those for a quick, a good, reliable, secure, quick access safe. Whether it's in the vehicle or whether it's next to my nightstand at home, I've got to keep keep the guns uh, secured uh, from the little ones. So, and I'm a I'm a sound sleeper. <laughs> so, anyway, we'll be talking about the ultimate guide to gun safes on Thursday, and on that day in the Facebook Live version of the podcast, we will be announcing a winner of. Hold on, what are we giving away this week? Where's Jacob? Where's my helper? <laughs> I, I forgot what we're giving away this week. <laughs> Dean said we're giving away a safe. I, I thought about that, but I didn't get approval from Jacob ahead of time, so we, we, we're not giving away a safe. What are we giving away this Thursday? Oh, it's in the email. Hang on, guys. Uh, it'll come to me. I'm sorry. I just... I just uh, I came up with this on Saturday, but but I can't remember everything all the time. <laughs> oh, where'd everybody go? We just lost like 20 people. Uh, Thursday, sounds like a good show. Good. I'm glad you think so, Chad. Um, on Thursday? Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was getting confused about something. So Thursday, Facebook Live viewers, we will give away a copy also of the Complete Home Defense DVD set. And then... What I was getting confused about is that I know that the following Tuesday, so I'm giving you a little bit of a week and a half preview, actually, actually eight day preview here. We're gonna give away a Tacwear TW350 flashlight on Tuesday of next week uh, for the podcast giveaway. So there you go, a little bit of a preview of what we got coming up. So let's talk now about traveling through states or other states or traveling out of state, what to know before you go. The first thing I look into is, because it's easy, is reciprocity. And so I'm going to look and see if my concealed carry permit is valid in the states that I'm going to be traveling through. I'm going to be, actually it's looking like this week I'm heading to, heading to Nebraska uh, so for, for a day or two. So uh, uh, exciting news coming from something we're doing out that way and we'll, we'll keep you apprised here in coming weeks. But So I'll be heading to Nebraska. And uh, so I could go to, the easiest thing to do is to go to the Concealed Carry Gun Tools app that uh, ConcealedCarry.com uh, makes or developed and go to the Maps page and Reciprocity part of the Maps page and plug in your permit information. So me personally, I have a, a Colorado resident permit and I have a Utah non-resident permit. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Either one of those would be valid in Nebraska. Uh, but I've got them both, and so I can plug in my permits, and actually I have it saved in my profile on the app. So all i got to do is select the Use My CCW Permit Info uh, part on the Reciprocity map, and it automatically, when, as soon as I go to that Reciprocity page in the app, it generates my my custom, because it's it's using my Colorado and Utah permit information to create my own custom map. And that it tells me first off that Nebraska is all green. Later this year in uh, May, we got to head out to Pittsburgh, and I'll be hauling a big trailer for the Concealed Carry Expo. We'll be doing the same thing we did there last year, which was live three days of coverage uh, from the Concealed Carry Expo, 
Uh, of course, that's put on by the United States Concealed Carry Association. Uh, we team up with them to bring to you all of you live from the show three days of coverage of that event. It's pretty cool stuff. So I got to take out all kinds of stuff to make that happen and make that possible. It's going to be a long drive. Uh, I'll be passing through quite a few states on that drive. And one of those will be Illinois. And I know we had somebody here, I can't remember who it was, that, that is in Illinois. And Illinois is definitely a state that does not honor my Colorado or Utah non-resident permits. So that's one really important thing to understand uh, as far as reciprocity is concerned, that uh, I got to know my laws. Uh, so in Illinois, my, the ideal tr uh, trip that I will make through Illinois is to pass straight through and not have to stop anywhere. Uh, so if you got to if you if you're feeling like you got to get some fuel uh, for the for the vehicle for the truck whatever then you might want to stop you know in, in Iowa or uh, if you can get all the way through the other side and you know fill up in uh, Indiana so the point is is I, I can't carry concealed in Illinois uh, as they do not have reciprocity with my state's permits uh, now I did learn well, not too long ago actually and this was news to me uh, that uh, as long as you remain in your vehicle uh, in Illinois that I can have that gun with me but I can't get out of the vehicle so anyway um, and I mean is that even covered here in the I'm checking in the traveler's guide what's that is it in the book it's in the book it's in our app though it's in the app oh good there you go what, what were we talking about the book for then yeah and that's another great thing about the concealed carry gun tools app is and Jacob's got his. You mind if I uh, show on screen here? I'm, lo I'm loading it. Hold on. Oh, oh, he's he's just not fast enough. Usually Jacob's like all on top of it. There's Illinois. It's loading. Yeah. So also in the concealed carry gun tools app uh, is the law summaries, and you can see right here. Uh, da, 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 da. Vehicle possession by non permittees non permit tees. If you possess a, possess a permit from your home state, you may carry a loaded handgun in your vehicle in Illinois. Long guns must remain unloaded and cased. If you lack a permit, you must stow any farms in the trunk. That is right there in the Concealed Carry, Concealed Carry Gun Tools app. I have a hard time forming my consonants today. Uh, so, another great reason to have the Concealed Carry Gun Tools app. So, and you can download that, by the way. You can just go to concealedcarry.com forward slash mobile app. And whatever device you're on, it'll automatically open the uh, app in the uh, App Store or Google Play Store. Uh, works pretty, pretty snazzy. So... Anyway, Illinois, as long as I just stay in my truck and shoot on through, don't make any stops anywhere, I have nothing to worry about. Uh, but those, those are good things to know about. And again, there's a lot of great info in the Traveler's Guide. There's a lot of great info in this new ebook that we just launched. Uh, the, uh, again, the, it's called The Legal Boundaries by State, The Travel Guide for American Gun Owners. And we just, just barely launched that book last week. Uh, I had to spend a bunch of late nights finalizing some of the editing and and even inputting some of the content into that book, uh, it was a bit of a bit of a chore getting it all done. And I see that uh, either Jacob or Mitch or somebody has posted the link there again, concealedcarry.com forward slash law ebook. Uh, we, we like having a lot of different tools at our disposal for getting this kind of information. So we make a lot of legal information available in the Concealed Carry Gun Tools app, and that's totally 100% free. We don't upsell you anything in the app. There's no premium version of the app. There's no ads in the app. Uh, so you can just go to the Concealed Carry Gun Tools app, pull a lot of this information right from in, in the app. Uh, but it's also helpful to have that, that e, the new ebook, The Legal Boundaries by State, because that goes even into greater depth on a number of topics. And then this is also just a handy one. Sometimes technology doesn't work. So a hard copy of the Traveler's Guide to the Firearm Laws, the 50 states, not a bad thing to have as well. I'll have a copy of this just sitting in the truck uh, on my trip as I go through the, probably Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Ohio, and then into Pennsylvania uh, to Pittsburgh for the show. Tris says he loves the app. That's awesome. Diane, good afternoon to you as well. Uh, let's see. And then, yeah, I see some of you kind of chatting about the actual uh, uh, Concealed Carry Expo. And hope that some of you can make that. It's a it's a great show. It, it is in Pittsburgh, and that is like May 17th, 18th, 19th, I think. Uh, somewhere around there. It's the middle part of May. And uh, yeah, you can go to usccaexpo.com 
and you can get uh, uh, tickets or whatever, learn about more info about uh, the expo. Jacob and I will be presenting there uh, some seminars and also some live demonstrations on their demonstration stage, as well as doing that live three-day coverage of the show. We'll have all kinds of interviews with people at the uh, at the show. Uh, well, we've we've in fact, anybody know who Instructor Zero is? Uh, it's looking like we'll have Instructor Zero on uh, for a little interview on our show uh, while we're there. So uh, that's just one amongst. Uh, Dave Spaulding will probably be on as well. Uh, Kevin Michalowski from USCCA. We'll have Tim Schmidt on, I'm pretty sure. He was on like three times with us last year. So uh, you, you'll definitely want to be tuning into the live broadcast that we do for the three days from the show. And that'll be aired on YouTube, and you, you'll be able to find that on our website, uh, Facebook, and uh, elsewhere as well. So anyway, all right, so what else to, write, to research? Uh, reciprocity. Uh, so check that first. And then start, and then I start be, becoming familiar with. Uh, I, I like to kind of do an outward thinking approach. So I think about, all right, I'm traveling through these states. I'm in my vehicle most of that time. So what are the laws as it relates to firearm possession inside the vehicle? And I kind of talked about that a little bit as far as being in Illinois. I don't have permit reciprocity in Illinois, but I can still carry my gun you know, with me in the vehicle as long as I stay in the vehicle and, and don't make any stops or get out of the vehicle. If I, if I did need to stop and get out, I'd need to follow the fire own protect, fire own. I don't know why I keep trying to say like fire owners or something. Firearm Owners Protection Act, uh, 926A, that's kind of, the, that's, a, that's a big deal and it's really important to understand uh, what, the, what the FOPA, uh, that's the acronym for it, what FOPA actually says and what it means. So if you look carefully, in fact, I think there's a, a summary or a, even a quote of FOPA in the Traveler's Guide book here. Uh, seem to recall seeing that somewhere. It's definitely in the A-book, absolutely. Um, maybe it's just summarized in the beginning here. But in FOPA, it talks about... In when you ha so basically the whole idea is that you have protection to be able to possess a firearm from a place that you are traveling from, and assuming you can still possess that firearm in the place where you are traveling to, but somewhere in between you got to pass through a, a jurisdiction or a state where that firearm is not permissible, is not legal or whatever. Uh, then what do you do? How do you handle that? How do you travel through that? restrictive uh, jurisdiction so in FOPA it's again I kind of gave you a hint there it's got to be something where you originate from a place where that firearm is legal to own or possess and you are traveling to a place where it is legal to own or possess and as when but for the jurisdiction that you are passing through that is restrictive you've by in, by federal law you've got to unload that firearm and uh, and this is the procedure that I follow. Unload the firearm, unload the magazine. Uh, I, I'll keep the magazine with the firearm, but I'll take the ammunition and store it in its own little box or whatever. And then package that firearm and ammunition in a hard-sided hard -sided locked case. And typically I'll put that, you know, like in the trunk or in the back of the, you know, whatever, the back of the vehicle, the, fur the furthest point, just, just, just because I think that's a good, good, good thing to follow. Firearm owner protect, firearm owners protection act. I don't know what my deal is today. This is hilarious. It also says it as long as that firearm and any ammunition for it is stored in a separate compartment away from the passenger compartment of the vehicle, that that's also acceptable. So worst case scenario, this is not what I would consider a best practice, but technically by the verbiage of the law. Of the law uh, you can actually unload that firearm and store it in any ammunition in like the trunk of a car. If that trunk can't be accessed from the passenger uh, compartment of the vehicle, then that's also acceptable, but not really best practice. So I like having a, e even just if it's a simple plastic hard-sided case that you can put a lock on that doesn't allow you to pry that open and reach in and access the gun or the ammunition, you should be fine. Uh, but I'll, I'll typically travel with, and I always have in my vehicle anyway, a, I have the uh, Sports of Field RV1 safe, which is just a little, it's kind of a clamshell style, uh, little, little handgun vault, quick access style. And 
I'll unload the firearm and take any, it and any ammunition and place it inside that, lock it up, and I'll just stick it underneath the back seat of, the, of my truck. Jacob's bringing over an RV1 right now. Uh, so, thank you, sir. So this is the RV1. We, you can see we have these in stock here in the warehouse. Uh, that's, this is, that's where these ship from. This is sealed, so I won't go ahead and open it. But uh, So, yeah, that's, that's what I have in the vehicle, and that works really well. <clears throat> now, a lot of times I get a question about... Well, don't I have to have the ammunition separate from the firearm? Uh, that's not true according to the Firearm Owners Protection Act. Uh, so 926A, that, that, that doesn't say, it doesn't say that at all anywhere in that statute. So uh, as long as you've got the firearm unloaded and the ammunition, it, they could be together in that same hard-sided locked container. Uh, so as long as you do that, you should be just fine. Now. Probably not a bad idea to have a copy of, of FOPA or 926A or have something like this or have the app uh, where, you know, I've seen where police officers don't understand the laws and specifically they don't, they may not understand federal law as well as they should. Uh, law enforcement officers typically when they, you know, in here in Colorado, you get so many, you know, dozens and dozens of hours. It's like 80 hours or I don't know. It's a lot of hours of, of, legal training when you're going through the police academy. Almost all of that legal training is focused on Colorado statutes, right? So very little, if, if any at all, is going to even deal with anything federally, like the Firearm, Firearm Owners Protection Act. So uh, that's one of the reasons why you know people sometimes get in trouble still when they're traveling through states. Uh, they get in some kind of weird situation. For some reason, their vehicle gets searched. An officer finds they have a, a, a firearm in there that according to that state's laws or that jurisdiction's laws, they shouldn't be able to have. And the, the, you know that law enforcement officer may not know any better or any different. Uh, so you might want to you know have a copy of things of the law available so you can you know have that be able to show that to them. That might be enough to convince them, or things might just not go very well for you that day. So, uh, but generally speaking, as long as you store the firearm as I've described. And as long as you abide by all uh, traffic laws, you should have no, nothing to worry about, right? Uh, but I would caution you about uh, some of the more tricky jurisdictions would be places like New York State, uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts. Certainly have heard some horror stories of some of those uh, states in the Northeast that, uh, and, and here's the other thing too. Sometimes people get in trouble because they have traveled to that state. Uh, so there was a case where a security officer went to New Jersey with a gun that was he was not allowed to have there. And uh, he also had it loaded and it was underneath his seat, I think, or something like that. He got in an accident and that firearm was discovered. And now had he had it unloaded and stored properly, it might have been better. But even then he was traveling to New Jersey and not through New Jersey. And that's where that's the important distinction in FOPA. Uh, so some things to kind of be aware of, it, I, it, FOPA could have been written maybe even a little bit better. Uh, I mean, for instance, if you're traveling to New York and for the whole time and duration while you're there, you keep that illegal <laughs> firearm in mag any magazines and stuff, uh, you kept it locked away, unloaded in your hard sided case. And as long as you remained in that state, I think that would be reasonable. But unfortunately that's not what the law says. So that's uh, that's good to know. California is a no-no. You know, so California is interesting, right? Um, if I was going to be traveling to California, uh, I don't have reciprocity there as far as my permits are concerned. There are certain guns I could take with me to California, but I, you know, I would need to make sure that the guns I take with me to California were legal in California. Uh, as far as I'd, I'd want to make sure, I'd probably want to make sure I abide by the magazine capacity uh, limit of 10, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so, I mean, Alan says California's a no no. Yeah, well, it's not my favorite place to go as far as firearm laws are concerned. It doesn't mean I can't go there with a gun. It's just I have to be a little bit more ca careful and cautious. And by the, by the way, again, you can find information about California's laws in our app and in the new ebook, Legal Boundaries by State, and also in the Traveler's Guide. All right. Uh, let's see. Hey, Mary from Indiana. Uh, Jeffrey is checking in from Kansas City, Missouri. Skip from South Carolina. Good stuff, guys. Uh, any questions? Feel free to drop any questions. 
All right, so I've, I've talked a little bit about uh, reciprocity, uh, talked about FOPA, and uh, the next thing I would look at is, is I, I, you know, I, I, oh, and I told you I'd, I check like what are the laws regarding me being in or around my vehicle and as it relates to firearm laws or firearm possession in the vehicle. So before I got a Utah non-resident permit, and pretty much the whole reason I have a Utah non-resident permit is so I can go to Nevada, which I go to, you know, I've go, I, I go to Nevada occasionally. Uh, I like to be able to still carry concealed while I'm there. Uh, but there was a time I didn't have an, a, a Utah non-resident permit, which granted me reciprocity in Nevada. Colorado does not have reciprocity there. So uh, before then, obviously I couldn't carry concealed in Nevada. Uh, now, Nevada had a unique law. Uh, then this is not all that unusual. Uh, there's a lot of states that are kind of similar in this regard, uh, but Nevada is a little bit more specific. And I gave the example of Illinois a minute ago, but Nevada, if you don't have a permit, you can carry in your vehicle, but it has to be open, openly carried, which is kind of interesting and unique. Uh, so the first time I ever drove to Nevada while carrying a gun, I uh, was carrying it concealed all the way through Utah and everything, and then, I, and then you go through the corner of Arizona, that was not an issue, <clears throat> and then you hit Nevada, and I, I literally did this in the car. I literally just went, Boop. I know you can't see it, I just pulled my gun, or my shirt back behind my gun, <laughs> because according to the statute, like that, as long as I was carrying openly in the vehicle, that was okay, I couldn't get out, well, I guess Nevada is... I think Nevada is an open carry state, but I, I wasn't really interested in carrying openly while I was there. But anyway, just some, you know, there's always these weird little nuances. So I always kind of start with reciprocity and then kind of go outward as far as what can I do in or around my vehicle? What do I need to be concerned about when I'm traveling through a jurisdiction that's, that's restrictive? And so I'm going to try to abide by FOPA when I'm doing that. And then let's think even bigger. Well, chances are if you're traveling out of state, you may be staying in a hotel. You may want to review laws as it relates to hotels uh, or motels or extended stays or whatever in, in the state that you're going to. Some states may grant you uh, the same rights in a hotel as you would have in a home. Uh, and actually that's probably the case in a lot of, case, in a lot of places, but, uh, but that's not a guarantee. So you want to review laws as it relates to that, staying in hotels or motels. Uh, <clears throat> you may want to pay a little bit of closer attention to uh, places like banks or churches or, and here's another one uh, to be aware of. In many states, if you have a state-issued permit and provided that that state has a statute uh, allowing you to uh, take a gun onto school grounds, and that, that's usually in the form of you may go onto school grounds if you're in your vehicle, right? So federal law actually doesn't allow you to go within a thousand feet of a school on a public uh, thoroughway, thoroughfare. Uh, did I just say thoroughfare? Yeah, I did. Uh, so you, but in most cases, if you have a permit from the state that, that, that you're in there and they allow you to, uh, for, for instance, here in Colorado, I can carry in my vehicle, I can have a gun in my vehicle, I can, it could be pretty much anywhere in the vehicle, as long as I remain in the vehicle when I go through the school zone or you know through the drop-off area at my kid's school. But if I'm gonna get out of that vehicle, then the firearm needs to be secured in a, it says a compartment uh, here in Colorado. It doesn't necessarily have to be unloaded, it doesn't have to be stored a certain way, it just needs to be in a, some kind of compartment in the vehicle and then I can exit the vehicle and make sure that the vehicle is locked. Now, best practice in my world is that I will actually take the firearm and secure it in an RV1, like this. Uh, but, uh, that, because I think that's just, that's best practice. So, then I'll start, you know, in other words, as I'm thinking outward, I'm thinking about all these places I can or cannot go and I want to be aware of. Now, I know some of you out there are probably thinking, well, the Second Amendment is my permit. And what they don't know what they don't know. And, uh, uh, as long you know, concealed means concealed. Uh, I believe in being law, a law-abiding citizen, and I do my best to wherever I go uh, to obey the law. All right. So I, uh, and this is a good example right here. Sonia says the parking lot of post office is a no-no. That is absolutely true. Uh, in fact, there's some fairly recent court cases dealing with situations like that, where someone. <clears throat> 
took a gun onto post office grounds and was arrested and charged uh, with you know federal felonies uh, for doing that. So that's serious business. Every time I visit the post office, I, I hate it. And I know some of you disagree that, oh, well, they don't know what they don't know. So like, what's, what's the big deal? Uh, but I will park across the street from the post office, secure my firearm in there, and then go into the post office and handle my business. It's a pain in the butt. It's an extra couple of steps. I don't necessarily, I don't like even handling my firearm uh, necessarily, uh, administratively, but that's the law. And being law abiding citizens means being responsible about the law. <clears throat> There's ways that we have here in America to change laws. And uh, that's, you know, if we have a problem or an issue with the law, we should work to change it. It's probably a long road <laughs> in some cases, but uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, and that's, that's what living in, Amer in, in the United States of America is, is all about. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, and I see David here also commented about post offices. Uh, yeah. So Alan asked about, is my, my brother stationed in Colorado? Can he open carry his pistol? And he can in almost every jurisdiction except for the county or city of Denver. Uh, they have a open carry prohibition in, in Denver. Um, this is good to know, Elkie. By the way, Lutheran Hospital in Re Wheat Ridge now has metal detectors. Hmm. Yeah, quick trip back to the truck. Uh, I've had three of my children delivered at Lutheran here, uh, there in Re Re Wheat Ridge. And uh, now I abided by, by you know, it was, they were gun-free zones. I did not carry uh, in the hospital there. But uh, it's good to know that they also have metal detectors now. And I've seen that St. Anthony's off... Uh, St. Anthony's Hospital here in Lakewood also has metal detectors, at least in the emergency room department. And funny story there is once I had to run to the emergency room uh, and I had to secure my firearm in the vehicle knowing that I was going to encounter a metal detector. Uh, so, yeah, that's not fun when you're... When you, now, if you're in a genuine emergency, particularly if you're the one that's like really hurt, I would just go to the emergency room and let them handle that. Uh, but in that case, I was actually taking uh, my wife <laughs> to the to the emergency room, and I had to secure the firearm before I got there. Uh, oh, and Elke uh, clarifies, yeah, the ER part of Lutheran. Gotcha. Good, good to know. So, yeah, um, some states will have specific restrictions as it relates to churches or banks. Uh, most probably really don't do not. Uh, but you want to be mindful of that and pay attention to that. So again, reference the Concealed Carry Gun Tools app or the new ebook, Legal Boundaries by State, or Traveler's Guide. Uh, what, what other sort of things do you guys wonder about? Okay, um, any questions? Um, how about constitutional carry? Let's let's talk about constitutional carry real quick. Because um, some states, constitutional carry in that state will mean that it's anybody in that state can carry without a permit. All right. But states like Idaho, it's specific to Idaho residents. So you, you, you want to pay attention to some of those uh, types of issues. And then, of course, let's talk about constitutional carry as it relates to traveling through other states. So you may be practicing carrying concealed under constitutional carry statutes in your state, but it does not afford you any sort of reciprocity in other states. Uh, so unless you're, unless you're going to another state like, say, Vermont, uh, where constitutional carry is the law of the land, and, and, and they don't even really issue permits. So, uh, so yeah, constitutional carry, it's cool. Like I, I support it, but it doesn't afford you anything reciprocity-wise. So I still think it's really worthwhile to have a permit uh, so that you can carry when you may travel from state to state. David asks, is this true or not? In Colorado, there has to be a metal detector at every entrance to the building for it to be illegal to conceal carry besides federal land. Okay, so that's, um, there is something about that in Colorado. <clears throat> in Colorado, and it's actually specific to public buildings, and by public we, def we mean define, we define that as uh, a, like a, a public government building. So like a state government, a county government, a city government building. There's a specific statute here in Colorado that uh, they have to have screening taking place at every entrance of the building. And that could be in the form of, of a actual search by security guards or a handheld metal detector or walk through metal detectors or x-ray scanners. Some sort of screening activity has to be taking place at every entrance of the building for 
concealed carry to be illegal in those public buildings, state, county, city government buildings. That specific part of that statute does not apply to other uh, other buildings, other properties. Okay, so like hospitals, it, that that doesn't necessarily apply to that. Um, any private corporation, business, property owner, whatever, can post simple signs in Colorado and say, no guns allowed here. Uh, it's debatable whether that carries the weight of law here in Colorado. Uh, some think that they do not. Some feel that it's a risk, a risk not worth taking. All right, so now many of you may be in states where uh, businesses can post stuff, you know, post signs prohibiting guns, but in some states they don't carry any weight really at all. In some states they do. Like Texas would be a good example. If, if, if they're actually abiding by the 30-06, the 30, you know, 30.006 uh, statute, if they're actually posting signs that are compliant with the 30.06 statute and you still violate that, uh, that carries the, the weight of law, the force of law, right? Kevin says, I'm injured at work while carrying and have to be driven to the hospital immediately. What should I do with the firearm? Um, it, I would say it depends on the, and that's a really good question. I would say it depends on the severity of the injury. If you are still, if you're not bleeding to death, if you can still breathe and walk and talk, uh, and it's not like a sudden, you know, immediate emergency, threat to life in other words, then I would suggest you probably carefully secure that firearm uh, responsibly, all right, before you go to the hospital, because that'll just save you a little bit of drama when you get to the hospital. But if you're really, really seriously hurt, uh, then don't, you know, because here's the thing, if you're really badly hurt, your adrenaline is really, you know, through the roof, uh, you're shaky, you're kind of flipped out a little bit, or maybe even dazed from whatever may have happened, whatever kind of injury it may have been, uh, it's probably not the best time to be handling a firearm, so you should let somebody else handle that for you. All right, so that's what I would suggest there. Uh, David says, late to the party, but what are the teeth of the law when it comes to places that have no gun signs, uh, not federal law? And I, I think I kind of addressed that, David. So I, did, you, did you catch that part just a minute ago? Uh, let's see, truck driving sucks. <laughs> Skyler says, Utah CCW holder here in Maryland at the moment. Yeah, I, I hear you, bro. Uh, let's see, um, Kevin, I'm injured at work while carrying, oh, that was, that, did I see that twice? Okay, let's see, oh, and Chad says, I've heard EMT has a lockbox for your firearm to be put in if you're transported, don't know if it's true though, uh, I, I would think that that probably is true in some cases, but probably not in all cases, uh, that may be something that specific jurisdictions, like certain counties or certain, um, you know, ambulatory agencies might have uh, available there in the ambulance, uh, but it may not be available in all ambulances or e with all EMT services. Um, David says, thank you, best answer I've heard. Oh, great, awesome. And uh, let's see, Kevin, oh, I see, responding to the EMT thing. Kevin shattered his elbow, true story, dude. I've had some pretty severe injuries myself. I was not carrying the day though. I fell almost 30 feet off a roof when I was working construction and broke a bunch of ribs and punctured my lung and probably could have died. Uh, but I was not actually carrying that day. Uh, so I didn't have to worry about it on that particular day. That was that was a long time ago. That was before I was even really a active concealed carrier. Um, let's see. All these laws, I'm scared for the people that don't do their due diligence in learning all this and decide to just constitutional carry. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot at stake here. I mean, there, and the laws can be so wide and varying and confusing at times. Uh, we got to do our best though, to understand them. Ignorance is not bliss in my opinion in this regard, uh, because regardless of how ignorant you may be or play yourself as being, if you break, particularly when it comes to firearm laws, generally when, when these laws are broken and you get caught, it generally goes very poorly for you. So uh, do your best to research. That's why we're big advocates about uh, having the information at your fingertips, having whether it's the physical copy of the Traveler's Guide, whether it's the new ebook from us, Legal Boundaries by State, the Travel Guide for Firearm Owners and American Gun Owners, and or having, this is actually not a phone, but I'm holding it up like it is a phone, having the app on your phone from us here at ConcealedCarry.com, the Concealed Carry Gun Tools app with all the legal summaries in there, the reciprocity maps, there's a lot of really great info in that app. You guys got to go, go download that. ConcealedCarry.com forward slash mobile app. Uh, Kevin says, I fell off a roof too. 
<laughs> and to give my carry gun to a very trusted coworker. And, and I think you played it the right way there. So, uh, you know, I'm sorry you fell off the roof. Uh, I'm guessing because you're commenting that you're, you're, you're okay. Uh, it took me, you know, with the broken ribs and the punctured lung, I was, I was in a pretty bad way for about two months. That was not fun. Dude, I would go through some of the other things that are in this legal summary. So a lot of these things a person needs to check, like restaurants that was the... Hey, thanks. Know, well, see, and I'm using my phone for the Facebook Live, and yeah. so Jacob's yeah. handed me his phone. Yeah, state parks, national parks, restaurants that serve alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Notified law enforcement, places off limits. Those are all things. Um, that's, that's a good point. So talking about state parks or national parks, now, now you should know that national parks and monuments in, Colorado, or in, the, in the U.S., uh, follow, according to a law that was passed back, I think in 2012, actually signed into law by President Obama, which comes as a surprise to some people. Uh, but the law changed uh, uh, about six, seven years ago, where now national parks and monuments follow the law of the state that they're that they are based in. All right. So if your state generally allows, if your state allows you to carry in state parks, for instance, hey, we have a delivery from FedEx. <laughs> Uh, convenient. Uh, oh, cool. H and H medical gear. We just ordered a bunch of uh, medical gear for the store, so you'll be seeing that on our store here very soon. That's exciting. I'm super stoked. Uh, so, uh, state parks. Uh, some states allow you to carry in state parks. Some do not. And then again, as it relates to the national parks and monuments, uh, you'll want to double check on that as well. Uh, firearms on school grounds, uh, besides K through 12, talking about colleges and universities. Uh, some states, obviously, that's okay to do, and some's not. That's also in the app here. So, see, I'm just going to work my way down this. Firearms at K through 12 schools. This is re this is re relating to Illinois, by the way. See that Illinois law summary? Firearms at K through 12 schools. Permittee may have loaded handgun in vehicle. Again, that specifies permittee. Uh, so, and that generally is applicable only to the permittee that has a permit from that state. Magazine capacity limitations. FOID card required, uh, that's the firearm owner's identification card that's required to have a firearm in Illinois. That's the one thing that really does suck about Illinois. Uh, and restrictions may apply on magazines in some jurisdictions. Yeah, there's a couple of cities in Illinois. Uh, Chicago, Aurora, uh, Illinois, I know is another one. Um, I, have, I just looked these up the other day. There's a couple of cities, and they're mostly, mostly in the Chicago metro area that prohibit magazine capacities of certain, certain limits. But there's actually, contrary to what a lot, of, a lot of people believe, there's not a statewide magazine capacity uh, law or ban. So anyway, suppressor ownership, however, is prohibited in Illinois. That's not cool, right? So and that's another thing. If you, have, if you are the owner of a suppressor or any short-barreled rifle, so anything that falls under NFA uh, type you know, uh, laws, federal laws, then there are additional things that you got to do as it relates to the suppressor or short-barreled rifle that you will be trying to travel through other states. Uh, there's a form that you're supposed to fill out uh, anytime you do this. Uh, I think you actually only have to fill it out once per year or something, but I, I don't. this is not an area of the law I really look that closely at because I don't own anything uh, yet. I have a suppressor actually in jail right now. But, uh, but you want to make sure that you're following state laws as it relates to those uh, specific items. So suppressor is not legal in Illinois. Uh, as to whether you can transport that through Illinois under FOPA, I'm not really sure on that, to be honest. Uh, that's something I would have it to... Doesn't say, it doesn't say, it doesn't it doesn't say anything about... Yeah, it doesn't say anything about... Yeah. That's why I say I don't really know about that. And that may even be like a gray area, almost like something that needs to be tested by a, uh, by a, by a case, by case law. Uh, I don't know on that. But uh, anyway, you want to just be aware of, of things like that as well. Uh, let's see, what else? I'm um, looking through here. There's lots of stuff here. And then there's a whole list in Illinois of places off limits. You see that? Woo, man, that's a list there. Uh, it talks about different public buildings, parking areas of some of those government buildings. Yeah. Uh, oh, and then also establishments that uh, serve alcohol. That's another thing, too. And a lot of states will use the standard of that business derives more than or less than 50% of their revenue from the sale of alcohol. So some states, if that business 
sales makes less than 50% of their money from alcohol sales, then you, you may carry concealed, for instance, into that restaurant or bar. If they make more than 50% of their sales from alcohol, then you may not be able to carry your firearm into that jurisdiction. We don't have to worry about that in Colorado, but there are some states where that's an issue. And you want to be in tune with that because you may not be thinking uh, about that. It, you know, For me, coming from Colorado, where we have very little in the way of laws, in fact, we, we have zero laws that, that say anything about alcohol serving establishments as it relates to the carrying of, of a concealed weapon. Uh, so I have to be a little bit more in, aware of that when I travel to other states if I'm going to set foot into, say, a restaurant that I, I, I see, I think, oh, it's a restaurant, I'm going to go get a bite to eat, and they sell alcohol there, but because they sell alcohol, now I can't carry there or something, you know, there's there's just some of those nuances you want to be... Like Chili's, Applebee's, what's up with that crap? Yeah, Chili's or Applebee's, uh, that, you know, where they sell alcohol, that might that might come into play, depending on the jurisdic jurisdiction you're, you're traveling through. Uh, <laughs> extreme close-up, that's funny. Uh, just looking through, uh, Dale from North Idaho stopping by. I'm glad you stopped by, Dale. Mark, I know, is an attorney. He says he's representing a guy right now that fell through a skylight and fell two stories. Yeah, I can tell you from experience, it is not fun. Don't fall, people. Use fall protection. Uh, <laughs> in the case where, in my situation, actually, fall protection wasn't required by law, but I kind of wish I had had it anyway. Uh, it was a work-related injury, and I, I did get great... Uh, coverage and protection uh, from workers comp and and insurance and everything but it was not a good experience <laughs> um, let's see uh, Jerry says cool need to fill out IFAC yeah uh, yeah we ordered we ordered a bunch of mini compression bandages we ordered regular compression bandages we ordered uh, we've never stocked this stuff ourselves in the store so we're, we're just starting to do that we've got some we're trying to get some some more tourniquets and things uh, working on a deal with uh, tac Tactical Medical Solutions to bring in their SOFT, their soft T wide tourniquets. Uh, working on, we, we do have cat tourniquets on our site. Uh, those are actually shipped not out of our warehouse here, uh, but we are looking at maybe bringing those in house. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll be stocking a bunch of really great stuff here very, very soon in the, in the store. So you'll see this go up very soon. Mark Walters, David says, talks about how to get the ability to carry on core, core property. I'm not exactly sure uh, what that's saying, David. Sorry. Uh, I was going to try to address it. But Jared says, what about buildings in national state parks? Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, so I talked about the national and state or the national parks, monuments. Let's, let's talk about the national parks monuments and memorials, all right? Not state ones at this point. So I said that that, that national park, for instance, will, will follow the laws of the state where that park is based in. So for instance, here in Colorado, we can carry in state parks, we can carry in national parks here in Colorado. The same is true in Utah. And, and, and I, I use these two states as examples because I've been to pretty much every state or uh, national park in Colorado and Utah, which there's a bunch of really great ones. All right, so this is a great place to come for national parks. Uh, and you can carry in those parks. However, the buildings within those parks are considered federal buildings. And any federal building is off limits for guns. Uh, so that is a really important distinction. I'm glad you reminded me to touch on that, Jared. Uh, so yeah, make sure that you are paying attention to that. And I've, I've done that where I've carried concealed in a national park and literally had to and it gets a bit tedious and irritating but I'm not willing to take the risk of of getting caught so you got to take that gun out secure it in the vehicle and then go into the building uh, one thing too folks that say well they who, who, how are they gonna know I'm carrying concealed concealed is concealed what if here, here's a what-if scenario and this is one I use quite often what if you have a, a, a medical emergency in that restrictive environment? What if you have a medical emergency? Hmm? And I, I can just about guarantee you this has happened, where someone was carrying a gun, concealed, so nobody knew, but then they had some sort of medical emergency in that post office, in that federal building, whatever it might have been. Now they're getting carried out on a stretcher, and people are finding out, obviously, through the course of that, that, hey, this person's got a gun. Now you got, yeah, you'll get to the hospital. 
you'll get squared away, you'll get patched up and put back together again, but you're going to be seeing most likely federal charges. And the medical emergency, not something any, any one of us can control. So that's the example I like to use is you got to be thinking about that kind of stuff too. And still, like what if you are actually in a situation where you got to use that gun? Um, you're probably still really likely to get charged, <laughs> even though you may have saved the day. Now, I won't disagree with those that would say it's better to be <laughs> judged by 12 than carried by 6. That may be true. But again, think about the medical emergencies and also think about a, an equipment failure where that gun falls out of your holster or something like that. You might think, ah, that's not going to happen with my gun and my holster. It's never been an issue before. Well, I promise you there's other people that thought that was also the case for them, but then their gun fell out of their holster. Or um, even in something as simple as a, mag a spare magazine that you carry with you falls out of its pouch or falls out of your pocket, or you're reaching into a pocket and you accidentally expose something you don't mean to. There's so many things that could go wrong when you carry into non-permissive environments. Uh, anyway. Uh, all right, I'm gonna start wrapping it up here, but uh, let's see here. Love the close-ups. Yeah, you, you like that? Uh, can you guys do a podcast on putting together your own trauma kits on body, for vehicle, for range? I don't remember y'all doing one. If you did, I've lost track of what all you've covered by now. Yeah, that's so true. I, I lose track of everything we've talked about and covered because it is a bunch of it. Uh, I will say that we did do a, a medically focused episode. I can't remember the exact episode. Um, or even really when, but it is somewhere in the history of, of all the podcasts, all 300 episodes of them. There is one where we, we kind of talked about that a little bit, but this would be good to do and do even a, a refresher um, about that, all right? So, and especially since a lot of our Guardian Nation members are sitting there probably with an ankle uh, IFAC, you know, the actual ankle cuff itself that we shipped in our most recent Guardian Nation gearbox, probably sitting there going, what do I do with this? Where, what do I put in there? Uh, so that that's not a bad thing to do. Uh, we could do a podcast. I think probably doing a video also and putting on our YouTube channel would be really helpful as well. Now, I'm not a medical expert. I've had some training. Uh, I think I know more than most, but uh, but still, I think I could comfortably talk about you know what to put in there, what I think is, is really key or important to have, especially as concealed carriers and gun owners. Um, my med kit, it doesn't really change a whole lot from body to vehicle to range. Uh, in fact, my, my, my vehicle kit is pretty much the same as my range kit. The only difference from going from on body carry to the vehicle or range is I'm gonna have a few, a few more things, you know, in bigger stuff. In my ankle kit that I carry on my, on my person, I carry the H&H &H, uh, mini compression bandage in that for a compression bandage, but that's, you know, because it's really the only thing that fits very well in the ankle kit, in my opinion. Uh, you can fit the bigger compression bandages in there. It just isn't as ideal or comfortable. Uh, so in the vehicle kit or the range kit, I'll have the much bigger uh, compression bandages, Israeli bandages, things like that, uh, as well as I'll have additional tourniquets in the vehicle or range kit as opposed to typically on my person, I only have one tourniquet. Uh, so because on person, that's 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 just that's emergency, you know, and and. Hopefully you don't need more than one tourniquet. Uh, that, that would be kind of unusual. Uh, but when, we're at, when we are at the range or the vehicle, you might come acro across a uh, bad uh, vehicle accident where multiple people are really severely injured, maybe have severe bleeding, so you might need more than one tourniquet. Uh, you could theoretically, hate to think about this ever being a possibility, but it is in fact a possibility. At the range, you could have a situation where not just one person accidentally gets shot, but two people get shot or more. So yeah, the range kit's definitely going to have more stuff in it than you know, more tourniquets, especially than uh, when I'm just carrying on my ankle. Um, let's see. Yeah, Shana says she's seen some really good videos on YouTube with Anthony Lambert and the Skinny Medic, Medic guy. They are really great videos, and there's good stuff too. I would encourage you to look into uh, Dark Angel Medical. Uh, they got a lot of great info on their website. And uh, I know there's and North American Rescue also has some good some good stuff. Uh, Tactical Med TAC Med Solutions uh, that makes the soft T wide tourniquets has some stuff on their website as well. A lot of really good resources out there. Charlie says, I suggest getting as many permits as you can afford. Multiple permits can overlap. They can also cover areas that certain permits may not. Now, Charlie, I 
I don't see any value in getting anything beyond a Utah non-resident permit when you will have a Colorado resident permit because you can't get any greater reciprocity by adding a Florida one or an Arizona one. The only situation I can think of would be if you, for whatever reason, thought you might go onto school property in your vehicle in places like Florida or Arizona or, say, Virginia for a Virginia non-resident permit. But you're not going to get any greater reciprocity, at least for Colorado residents, than to have a Colorado and Utah one. Um, I know I'm talking about a lot of Colorado-specific stuff. That's because, obviously, I understand the Colorado law is a lot better. Uh, as I live here and have lived here for a decade now and have taught firearms uh, courses here in Colorado for almost a decade. It's been quite a while now. Uh, let's see. All right, so we'll just kind of start wrapping it up here. I'm just trying to scroll through the comments and get the last few comments or, or questions. Uh, doctrine of lesser harm. Mark, I, I get what you're referring to there. Yeah, I mean... It, 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 it get a really good attorney, right? <laughs> you understand the importance of that, Mark, and hopefully one that can really make a strong case for for that doctrine, right? If you were in a situation, he's referring to a situation where you may use a firearm in a non-permissive environment. For instance, let's suppose I am not on school property, but I see something taking place at school, an active shooter, and I'm right there, and it, it just makes sense for me to try to respond, and I make that decision to actually do that. I'm not saying that's what you ought to do. Uh, you do need to be thinking about what's going to happen when police show up on that scene. Or maybe there's already a cop on that school grounds. And now I, I'm shooting the active shooter, but this cop doesn't understand that I'm actually the good guy trying to take out the active shooter. There's all kinds of things that could obviously go wrong in situations like that. Uh, but uh, the point is, is let's say I'm, I'm sitting here off school grounds. I see a shooting taking place on school grounds. I grab my gun. I run onto school property. I shoot the bad guy. I save the day. Doctrine of lesser harm would suggest that I should be prosecuted necessarily for violating, you know, the the prohibition about carrying my gun on school grounds. And the reason being is because I kept things from being way worse than they would have been. And that's, you know, any reasonable person will look at that and go, that's reasonable. But what I'm referring to is, is if you're in a non-permissive environment and particularly like federal buildings, it's just, I just don't like toying with the feds. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much what it comes down to. I I don't trust the feds. I don't like the feds. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't. I just highly strongly advise you to not carry guns uh, onto federal property. Uh, again, I think if you came from off property onto the property and saved the day, that's one thing. If you're knowingly already carrying onto the property. Uh, that's where I kind of think, you know, depends on how stingy the, the federal prosecutor wants to be. Kaoni asks, what's your preferred tourniquet? I really like the soft T wide tourniquets. The cats are okay. They're also good. Okay. Both the cats and the soft T wides. I think those are the two kind of industry standard, uh, tourniquets in the, uh, so I don't think you can go wrong with either one of those. But I like the soft tee wide a little bit better, and it usually is because I can package them a little more compactly, and they fit better in my kits, especially my ankle kits. Uh, I also just, to me, it feels like a more robust tourniquet. I'm not saying the cat has anything wrong about it. Uh, they certainly get the job done. They are certainly robust. It's just that the soft tee wide just really feels overly engineered, and that's probably why I prefer it a little bit uh, as well. Uh, I encourage people to use either one of the cats or the soft tee wides. Other tourniquets outside of that, I know the rats is really popular. I know that the uh, there's the SWAT T tourniquet. Um, there's the TK4, TK4L tourniquets. I think those all can get the job done, but I definitely think the cats and the soft tee wides are considerably better. Uh, and one of the reasons why is because you, you can continue to tighten those tourniquets more and more and more. And on some of the other tourniquets, you can only really get them so tight. And so if you've done everything you can to get that tourniquet tight and the blood still is not stopping, you're kind of, you, you, you're, your next recourse is to use another tourniquet. Whereas in the case of a soft tee wide or a cat, you can just continue cranking that down. Eventually you get to where maybe you can't crank it anymore. Um, but the likelihood of that is, is far less likely than having a failure in that tourniquet use uh, in the case of the rats or the SWAT T's and so forth, all right? Um, what kind of medical training do you suggest for the average gun owner? I think any medical training you can get, period. Get good, reputable, and start with a basic first aid CPR course, CPR AED. Uh, you know, anything that's taught by, like by the American Red Cross, 
or any of those common organizations that do those first aid and CPR and AED courses. And then beyond that, if you can if you can take a T triple C class, uh, if you can take anything that's above and beyond that, you're you're going to be in really good shape compared to the average person. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I know, dude. Jacob says it's been an hour. We should wrap it up. I know. I'm just having fun talking to my peeps, man. So, uh, Delena, stop the bleep class. It's a great, great class. Well, it has been an hour. And uh, shop talk, traveling out of state or through states, what should you know before you go? Guys, go pick up the copy of our new ebook, Legal Boundaries by State, the travel guide for the American gun owner. Uh, reduced price, big time. It, it's uh, marked for it's marked on our site for nine dollars ninety nine cents. Basically, it's a ten dollar ebook. It's worth it. It's two hundred and eight pages of really great information. Uh, but you guys can get it for basically seventy five percent off, two dollars and twenty three cents by going to concealedcarry dot com forward slash law ebook. And you'll have the opportunity to also buy one of these at a discounted rate. Uh, and, of course, there's the app, concealedcarry.com forward slash mobile app. Uh, free, totally 100% free, with a lot of other great information, including legal information, in the app. Guys, go do it. <laughs> Jared says not to be a buzzkill, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, no, we do have to go get, uh, we gotta, we, we're, we're going to go grab lunch, and i got work to do. So, Guys, thanks for being with me here today for this week's uh, Shop Talk. And uh, we will catch you in, tomorrow in the podcast. And again, for Shop Talk, Shop Talk next Monday, same time, same place. Have a good one.